Catherine, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm so excited. I have your book here with me. So I loved it. Thank you for being here. I like to start every interview by asking guests, as a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a therapist. (laughs) Ah, You did? (laughs) Yeah, I did. I was so lucky. Hmm. This is maybe one of the luckiest, best days of my life that I didn't even realize until years and years later was one of the luckiest, best days of my Mm. life. I was in middle school. I remember it vividly. We were learning about poetry Mm. and we were learning about haikus. And so to learn about what a haiku is, we were learning about what it is not. We were reading this really long poem that I have tried over and over again to find. I remember what the cover of the English textbook looked like, but that's all I remember about the book. It was about geese flying in a V formation. Hmm. And the poet was talking about how beautiful the geese looked in the sky and that they wouldn't position the geese in any other way. Hmm. And I remember reading that and just knowing, oh, that's what I'm going to do for my job. I am going to help people feel like they wouldn't want to be anywhere other than where they are now. And it wasn't like, I want to do that. That would be fun to do. This would be interesting to do. It was a recognition. It was Mm. coming from some deep place of that is what I will do. Mm. And I think that's what a recognition is. It's like a recognition. You're encountering something you already Mm. know on some level. Mm. And it was such a moment of lucidity. And Mm. I didn't realize how rare those moments Mm. are because I was a kid and I just thought, well, I guess everybody experiences that. (laughs) I have used that since that moment as a screen for everything I do. You know, I have come to translate that image of birds flying in a V formation as helping people to be present, Mm. even if what they're being present to is painful, Mm. even if they don't know how to be present helping myself to be present. And Mm. so my intention of that is to connect and heal through language and presence is the statement that I've always used. And the Mm. visual is like birds flying in a V. Mm. That's beautiful. And how old were you when you had that? I don't know. I must have been like 11 or Mm. something. You know how it's like Bill Gates was born when computers were beginning, (laughs) you know, it's like I was born when Oprah was on TV at 4 Mm. p.m. after school. (laughs) So I had a lot of models of therapists because Mm. she had therapists on her show all the time. So I understood that was a job you could have. Mm. And it seemed to me to be a really interesting job. And who knows if I didn't have that model, because I watched Oprah religiously since I was really little. I remember it came on at the same time as Batman. (laughs) I was like, oh, it's a commercial break. Let me flip to Batman. Let me go back here. Because there's something about the field and just connection and healing that always has drawn me near. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really resonate with that. I'm a huge Oprah fan. And um, who isn't? (laughs) So I think you just explained that beautifully, how it all connects to what you do. Did you follow being a therapist from that moment all the way through? And then do you mind sharing with the audience what you do today. Yeah. I majored in psychology in college. Mm -hmm. And I also had a lot of peripheral interests in business and marketing and advertising. And I figured out how to incorporate those into my work as well. I was really interested in public health and education. Mm -hmm. So I got my minor in education. And I did deviate from the course, but not from the intention. I remember being 21 I was graduating senior year of college and ready to just go straight into a doctoral program. Mm. And I had the wonderful opportunity to do an internship with Dr. Constance Hammond at UCLA's Hammond Lab, which like the lab is named after her. She's like a force. She's, Mm. She's incredible. And she wrote me a letter of recommendation for the school I wanted to go to. And after I read her letter, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna get into this school. And it wasn't a good feeling. Interesting. Something intuitively was like, you need to just go be 21. So I moved to London and bartended 
<laughs> I worked in a jewelry shop. <laughs> I worked in a jewelry shop all day. I bartended at night. I was like a coat check girl. I <laughs> did all kinds of jobs and just had fun and like mm. lived my life instead of trying to fast track my career. So that was like a deviation. But then when I moved back, I jumped right in. Was it from watching Oprah? Did you know you were tapping into your intuition? Like you know, that seems like such a deep kind of, yeah, knowing, I, feeling. I think, again, sometimes I think of myself as a 21-year-old and the word that comes to mind is just unconscious. Like so much of my life was not aligned with who I was. I had a professor in grad school who was so funny. She was always like, you're not even a real person until you're 27 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course it's not true. And she doesn't mean that in the invalidating way and all of that stuff, yeah. but meaning like so much is forming still. Mm. I mean, you're still in emerging adolescence at 21. Your brain is not done growing. So I don't know what that was, but I do think having the language of intuition and just having that word mm. helped me anchor myself to something internal instead mm. of external. And it was a very distinct feeling that was in contrast to my expectations. When I read that glowing letter from this powerhouse in the field, it would be like getting a glowing letter from Dr. Brene Brown. It's like, should make you so happy. And I just felt like I just contracted mm. and I had to respond to that. And sometimes I think I have had those feelings of knowing and I haven't responded mm. to them. Mm. And I've ignored them or tried to minimize them or say, I must have been tired. I'm having a bad day. You know, I think sometimes we answer the call and sometimes we don't. And I've done both. Mm. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking a lot about intuition and like really trying to be intentional about listening to that, knowing when there's that intuition. And, yeah. and I think for a lot of us, we can go through life, not listening, not even realizing it's there, or that's there to serve us. So yeah. How do you know when it is your intuition now that you're kind of probably, I assume, more intent on listening to it? Well, I think one way to tell the difference is that your instincts don't lie to you and they don't change based on your mood or your circumstance. Mm. So whereas a feeling is actually really subjective and fluid mm. and changes based on whether you've just had coffee or not, or whether someone attractive just hit on you you know, it's sunny outside. It's like your feelings are all over the place. Mm. And that's not a bad thing. But I say in the book, instincts and feelings both get a say, but instincts get veto power. Mm. It has to be your instincts that are consistent, the messages that don't change, mm. no matter how good or bad the scenario gets. Mm. That's what you know is true. Well, you mentioned your book, I'm so excited to talk about it. It's called The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. I'm excited to talk about it because I didn't realize I was a perfectionist mm -hmm. until I read the book. <laughs> and it was a powerful realization for me. I'm a people person. I'm a coach. I've had therapy and worked with lots of coaches. I love this stuff. And then when I realized I didn't know I was a perfectionist, it just hit me like, wow. You're describing my exact same experience. Uh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yes, really. And that's part of why I wrote the book, because mm. we talk about perfectionism like we understand it so well, like we understand it 100% and we know what it is and we know what it's not. And it's very black and white and we've got it all wrong. Mm. The research world agrees on the point that we're in the infancy of understanding this construct. And yet we talk about perfectionism in emotional wellness as if it's old news. Like we know exactly what it is. It's bad. We need to get rid of it. And healthy people aren't perfectionists. Mm. And there's so much more to the story. So Ugh. much more. Yes. And in my work with clients, I know sometimes that comes up, oh, I'm a perfectionist, right? So I think this book will serve me in helping serve my clients better. So you were working as a therapist at Google. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was working on site at Google. I had a private practice and I have worked in lots of different clinical contexts. Like I worked in a rehab. I worked with kids in the foster care system, mm -hmm. you know, doing more sort of social work heavy stuff. Worked all over the place. 
with every kind of demographic and perfectionists were everywhere. They were not just the high achievers, Mm. quote unquote, type A people. Mm. And so understanding patterns and being able to look at the arc of my career and realize that perfectionism is in so many different places made me understand that I didn't understand it as well as Mm. I thought I did. Mm. And ultimately I ended up recognizing it in myself and was also similarly shocked because I still don't know how any person can love Brene Brown as much as I do and still be a perfectionist. (laughs) I don't know her, but I imagine she's a perfectionist too. And so it's like just being able to expand our view and understanding of what perfectionism is for me was so helpful Mm. because it helped me locate it within myself, within my world, within my relationships, within my emotional landscape. Whereas otherwise, it was just whatever dynamic was presenting was just sort of nameless Mm. and hard to pin down. And I just felt like, why can't I get it together? What's going Mm. on? Just Mm. very nebulous and confusing. Mm. And I Mm. wrote the book to give myself language to anchor myself in my own experience. And I hope that it helps other people do that too. Yeah, it does. It's kind of like when Dr. Brené Brown talks about talking to the person sitting on the plane next to her, what do you do? And she responds, I study shame. And then that's pretty That shuts everyone up, right? (laughs) So in Catherine's book, she talks about the different types of perfectionists. So how did you go about classifying them, coming up with the different categories of perfectionists? Did you start seeing these patterns and say, that's perfectionist, but it's different from this person who's a perfectionist? Or how did that all come about? Yes, that's exactly what it was. It was being able to have the luxury of perspective of years and years and years of being Mm -hmm. in this space and recognizing patterns with a lot of predictability, say, this one client over here is going to respond in the same way as this person over Mm. here. Why is that? What is the tie that binds? I think a lot of people in psychology look for patterns. That's where attachment theory comes from. Mm. That's where five love languages comes from. And so there's this desire when you're talking to people all day Mm -hmm. and they are sharing the most honest, intimate truths of their life. You get this raw, unfiltered commentary on the zeitgeist. And you begin to notice things that don't necessarily come up in our everyday life because it's not a social norm to be divulging and connecting in the way that you might with your therapist. And so it feels special and Mm -hmm. it feels like, oh, I'm onto something. I can see something. Mm -hmm. I can see the writing on the wall. It's just blurry. Let me move closer. Mm. Let me figure this out. And I first identified what the dynamics of perfectionism were, being able to understand, for example, that perfectionism is not just expressed behaviorally in what we do and organizing all the things in a row and making everything look pretty and structured. It's also expressed emotionally. Emotional perfectionism is like, there is a perfect way to feel about this and I should feel it. And what I mean by that is not, I should be happy about this, but it is, I should be this much disappointed and this much proud mm. and that much curious. And we have these ratios in our minds mm. about what our emotional experiences should feel like. And we don't even realize we're carrying this expectation. And as soon as our actual experience with our partner, with our work, with our relationship to our body, with whatever it is, as soon as it deviates from this standard ratio pie chart thing we're holding, (laughs) we feel that something is amiss and that we're doing something wrong Mm. when we're not. Mm. We just aren't even aware sometimes of how perfectionism is showing up. Mm. I love that. And I wonder if you could talk through kind of the different categories of that perfectionist that you found. Yeah. Because there's more than just what most people think about. Well, I will start with the classic. And this is the closest to what most people think about. So this Mm -hmm. is your highly reliable person who adds structure to every situation that they're in. You can really depend on them. They do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it in the way that they said they would do it. Classic perfectionists are wonderful in all those ways. 
the cons of this type are that sometimes their way of interacting with people can feel transactional Mm -hmm. or not engender a spirit of collaboration because it's like, if I want this thing clean, I have to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes classic perfectionists can feel taken for granted because Mm -hmm. although they like and enjoy infusing structure into multiple environments, that doesn't mean it's not hard work. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean they don't want acknowledgement for that. But when you're known as the person who's like, oh, she always makes the reservations. She'll always do the deck for the presentation. She'll always do this or that. Or It's like people can easily take Mm. you for granted. Each type, I should say, has its advantages and liabilities, just like perfectionism itself. Perfectionism has its strengths and weaknesses. So the next type is the procrastinator perfectionist. And these are people who, in essence, want the conditions to be perfect before they start, which of course they never are. A procrastinator perfectionist on the pro side is a very thoughtful person. They can see a situation from a 360 degree angle. They excel at understanding different contingencies mm. and how they might unfold and being very prepared very well-versed in research or information about whatever they're trying to do. On the con side, sometimes their preparative measures can spill past the point of diminishing returns and they're over-preparing and Mm. under-executing. So Mm. they experience when their perfectionism isn't managed well, a kind of paralysis in which they're not actually executing or doing the thing that they want to do. And what's really interesting about this is doesn't matter if their goal is exciting to them or aversive to them. Like it doesn't matter if it's paying taxes or going on a date with someone they've had a crush on for a year. You know, Mm. it's like the paralysis is still there. The Mm. counterpart to the procrastinator perfectionist is the messy perfectionist. Mm. Messy perfectionists on the pro side are in love with starting. I like to say they're start happy. So they'll start a million (laughs) things and they effortlessly breeze through the anxiety of a new beginning. There is no anxiety in a new beginning for them. There's a lot of energy and momentum, natural enthusiasm. They're superstar idea generators. They can just see this thing going in so many different ways, whether it's a relationship or redecorating a room or a startup, whatever it is. The problem, if you're not managing messy perfectionism, is that unless you get a lot of support in the middle of the process, Mm. when you hit that inevitable tedium, which cannot match that romanticized perfection of beginning something new when everything is possible and you haven't had any problems yet. When you hit the tedium of that, it can really derail a messy perfectionist. Mm. They essentially want the middle of the process to stay perfect. The risk of messy perfectionists isn't so much that they, and procrastinator perfectionists, is not so much that they don't finish the thing or start the thing, but they allow that behavior to be a commentary on who they are and Mm. what they're capable of. Mm. So a messy or procrastinator perfectionist might say something like, nobody takes me seriously. I'm not disciplined enough. I can Mm. never finish. Mm. I'm lazy. I'm this, I'm that, whatever, all in your head. None of it is true. You just need to align yourself with support at different moments. Procrastinator perfectionists need support at the beginning, a lot of support. Mm. Messy perfectionists need support in the middle. Intense perfectionists want the end of the process to be perfect, which is to say they are after the outcome. They've got their eyes on the prize. They have razor sharp focus. They don't really care about being liked, which lends itself to effortless directness. And they really prize efficiency. So they can get something done. If you're not managing intense perfectionism well, what happens is that you get it done at the cost of your own well being or the mm. well being of those around you. So mm. intense perfectionists can really grind in a way that hurts them mm. and neglects all the things that bring them health and well being. And mm. their standards can also go from really high to impossible and they can impose those impossible standards on others. Mm. So it might look like, great, you got all of your Q4 goals met, but everyone on your team is quitting in two months because Mm. they're miserable. So the last one is Parisian perfectionists, which this perfectionism plays out interpersonally. The easiest way to say it 
and it's an oversimplification, is that Parisian perfectionists want to be perfectly liked. They also want to perfectly like others. So the ideal that a Parisian perfectionist is after is about connection. Mm -hmm. So while we tend to typically think of perfectionism in achievement contexts like academia or metrics, like a certain salary, job title, upward mobility, whatever, Parisian perfectionists are holding ideal connection. So they're naturally warm, naturally inclusive, Mm -hmm. really care about engaging, let's say, the person who's alone at the party. And you don't have to explain to a Parisian perfectionist how important relationships are. Whereas an intense perfectionist can lose sight of that quite easily. Mm -hmm. Parisian perfectionists never do. Mm -hmm. But the problem with this type of perfectionism, if you're not managing it, is you can try to take a shortcut to connection through things like people pleasing. Mm. And if you make a habit of that, you end up not only disconnected from whoever you're trying to connect to, but also disconnected to yourself. Mm. And that's obviously not good. (laughs) So (laughs) those are the five types. These types are fluid and they're context dependent. So just like any identity structure, being a perfectionist operates on a continuum. What you're really looking for is a patterned way of being. Mm. So which type do you relate to more often than not? During the holidays, for example, I really lean into classic perfectionist tendencies when that is not my mode. Most of the time, I'm mostly a messy perfectionist, then big chunk Parisian and a little bit intense. I have zero procrastinator perfectionist tendencies. (laughs) But during the holidays, I like wear pencil skirts and blow dry my hair and like really get obsessed with tablescapes and stuff like that. That is just not the way I engage normally. But the point is that these, again, are fluid and contextual, like all mental health. Mm. So I'm reading your book. I realized very quickly that I'm a Parisian perfectionist. So connection, relationships. And then when I read the piece where you talked about how you're a classic perfectionist during the holidays, Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, that's me. You do? Yes. During the holidays. (laughs) During the holidays and birthday parties, hosting. So like for a birthday party for my son, it has to be the perfect shade of blue on Mm -hmm. the invites or for the tablecloth. It has to be the right flowers and it has to be centered perfectly. And I'm not like that normally. Right, but when it right. comes to birthday parties, hot Christmas, like I want it to be this picture perfect thing. Yeah. So I found that fascinating. Mm-hmm. And so what are the benefits of having the awareness of what kind of perfectionism or how perfectionism might show up for us? The benefit is that you understand where you need help. And you understand where you can help others. Mm. I think Mm -hmm. messy perfectionists, for example, don't feel like they're doing something hard when they get excited about starting something new, right? Mm -hmm. They're just having a Tuesday morning, right? (laughs) (laughs) But if you have a procrastinator perfectionist friend or partner or child, whatever, and they're really trying to put their house on the market, they know what to do, they know how to do it, but they just can't get it started, right? There's a block. A lot of personal development stuff will say, here's how to get rid of the block. You can think about it this way and become someone who can execute and all of this Mm. stuff. And in my view, I take a strengths based approach to my work, which Mm. is let's talk about the strengths that already exist. Everyone has them. Let's figure out how to maximize those and leverage those instead of pouring all of our energy into identifying our weaknesses and trying to churn our weaknesses into strengths at the opportunity cost Mm -hmm. of neglecting our strengths. We're all so good at many things that we don't even realize our gifts because they come Mm -hmm. so naturally to us. Mm -hmm. And so the benefit of understanding which type you generally operate in is Mm -hmm. understanding how easy it is for you to offer help to other people who aren't that type and don't Mm. have such an easy time with the things that are effortless for you. And also understanding where to ask for help Mm. instead of trying to become someone you're not, just ask (laughs) for help with the stuff that are your weaknesses. As human beings, we will always have weaknesses. Even if you can figure out how to turn your weaknesses into strengths as we grow and develop, 
we also develop new weaknesses. Mm. Like we develop new strengths for a moment in time where we're not going to benefit from asking for help from someone who's naturally really great at whatever they're doing. That's a great point because it's focusing on not beating ourselves up for the things we're not. When I think about my own work in therapy and my work with clients is that it's the source of a lot of issues that come up for us. Like Mm -hmm. we're beating ourselves up for the thing we're not. We're beating ourselves up for the email we sent. There's a lot of Mm -hmm. beating ourselves up. And then I love that you said asking for help for the things that are our weaknesses. I read a book for entrepreneurs a while back and it said the title is who, not how. Mm -hmm. And so when we're struggling with an issue and we're thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to figure this out? Oh, I love that. The better question is, who Who? can help me? I am a Parisian perfectionist. I love connection, right? I love connecting relationships, talking to people, which is why I love doing this podcast. Yeah. (laughs) I am not good at the technical piece. I am not good at the editing, all that stuff. So one of the things at the beginning of the podcast was, I couldn't get it finalized at the beginning was because I was struggling with all of that. And so when I hired my team, who is amazing at it, I was able to continue this podcast because I think I would have given it up a long time ago because of the technical pieces. I think we are the same person. (laughs) Let me tell you, it's a miracle that I got the volume on on this thing. (laughs) And you're laughing, but anyone in my real life who knows me is like, it is not funny. She does not <laughs> I mean, we can't be good at everything, can we? Yeah. And it's not a big deal when understanding what is really hard for you and that it's okay. And that for mm-hmm. every single person you pass by forever, for the rest of time, there are a constellation of things that are mm-hmm. so tricky for them, that mm-hmm. are so easy for you. And some things are tricky for everybody. That's such a great word, constellation. I think Esther Perel used it in Mm. a podcast once. And I just- I love her. Me too. And I love thinking of when I meet someone, a client, I love to think about it like it's a constellation. There's all these like issues, problems, personalities, strengths, weaknesses, and it's just all in helping kind of put it together. And yeah, you you know, I really like that word because it doesn't connote a hierarchy. It's like, Mm. we're not trying to get up here. The top of a constellation is not better than the bottom or the sides or whatever. It just all comes together and it's an integrated model. Mm. I think visually a lot. And so just like the birds in a V constellations, Mm. spheres instead of sides, like Mm. I like those visuals to guide the way I'm working with others and myself. Mm. In the book, you also talk about, you use this word, when talking about perfectionists, you said maladaptive. Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other side of it, which I can't remember right now, is adaptive. The, the, mm-hmm. Adaptive. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So maladaptive and adaptive perfectionism are the ways the research world separates the type of perfectionism that can help you and that you can use to your advantage and the type of perfectionism that can hurt you. Mm-hmm. And that's quite dangerous. Again, this is all fluid. So a lot of people are like, well, how can I tell if I'm an adaptive perfectionist or not? And I'm like, let me kill the suspense. You're both, (laughs) I'm both, everybody's both. Healthy is not a coordinate in space. Mm. It's not a place where you can find, discover, plant your flag in and, Mm. and live there. We are all assuming that we're moving forward, which perfectionists generally do because you can't be a perfectionist without being ambitious and ambitious Mm. people just need to move, right? Mm. They have that drive. It's part of who they are. And the more momentum you have in your life, it's just the inevitability of encountering problems and stressors increases. And we don't always meet those problems and stressors in a perfect mindset. And so adaptive and maladaptive speaks to the multidimensional aspect of perfectionism, which again, really well understood in the research world for decades, not talked about in the wellness space. We talk about perfectionism in a very dichotomous black and white way. Perfectionism Mm. is bad. Mm. Perfectionists Mm -hmm. equal unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And when you layer 
women on top of that narrative about perfectionism and how bad and evil it is and how we need to exercise it from our minds and hearts and bodies, you really start to understand where some implicit messaging lies about how we treat ambitious women Mm. in the world right now. Yeah. And when I read that in your book, you said something around that the perfectionist term is really used around women or something like that is what I remember reading. And I thought, hmm, have I ever heard a man be called a perfectionist? And I couldn't think of anyone. Like I thought of Steve Jobs, but then he was considered a genius, you know, like. So it's interesting. It's a really gendered term. And while men are called perfectionists, their perfectionism is seen as visionary. It's seen as focused. It's seen as entertaining. If you think of the public persona of Gordon Ramsay, right? Mm. Of just Mm. needing the outcome. So that would be like an intense perfectionist, Mm. right? Need it to be perfect. And we celebrate him for it. We love it. A woman chef. Mm. That would not fly, right? Because she would not have a show. <laughs> she would not have a show. Or if she did have a show, it would be called something like Bitch Chef or something mm-hmm. like that instead of this like visionary person, right? Or monster villainizing, something like that. So if you think of another intense perfectionist like Anna Wintour, who runs Vogue, for example, mm-hmm. because she's not necessarily smiling all the time and warm and maternal and all the mm-hmm. things that women are expected to be, even in the workplace, the book loosely based on her called The Devil Wears Prada. And if a man was in that role, they would just be serious. They would be professional. They would be focused. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much language that's used to perpetuate Mm -hmm. gender performance expectations Mm -hmm. for girls, women, boys, men. When you think of language like resting bitch face, you notice that there is no translation for that for men. There's no resting asshole face. Mm. And that's because men are not expected to be pleasant and bubbly Mm. and palatable and pleasing all the time. So when men engage with you in a sort of stoic, neutral facial expression, there's no name for it because it's considered normal. Mm. That's not considered normal for women. So we name it. And the names are sort of fun in this certain way. But it's kind of like advertising. It's like seeing a commercial. Everyone thinks that advertising doesn't work on them. But when you look at advertisements from the 50s, you can clearly see Mm. what was at that moment implicit messaging. You can Mm. see that it has become explicit Mm. because we have the benefit of historical context to examine the ways in which we as a culture perpetuate The ideas we hold about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be in the workforce, what it means to be a man, all this stuff. And so there's a ton of language like that. And recovering perfectionist is a term that is so often used to describe women and not men. Men aren't really taught to recover from their perfectionism. Mm. They're taught to integrate it into the more holistic sense of who they are, to be proud of it, Mm. to express it. Mm. And no, it's like a man who wants power or is ambitious is considered an alpha male. Women who want that are considered power hungry. Then something will happen, which makes it so painfully apparent that we have so much work to do and that we really need to understand how we transfer these messages to each other and Mm. our children and ourselves. And it's not explicitly. It's not, hey, you should act this way. It's implicitly, the more subtle the messaging is, the more powerful it is. Because when you don't think someone's trying to get you to do something, there's no resistance. It just Mm. feels normal. Mm. Actually very directed. I interrupted you, I think, on the maladaptive and adaptive piece. So for that maladaptive and adaptive piece, how do you think we should integrate it into the wellness piece? So you mentioned that there's like a lot of research and you talk about it in the book. How do we understand those two terms to help us? Yeah, uh, it's a great question too. I think there are two questions to follow up with yeah. to understand whether you're engaging in an adaptive healthy way or a maladaptive unhealthy way. And those two questions are, how am I striving? Am I striving in a way that's hurting me or people around me? 
or am I striving in a way that's giving me energy, that's helping me build connections, that's Mm. helping me understand my level of resilience? And the second question is, why am I striving? Am Mm. I striving because I think that achieving whatever goal I'm setting out to achieve is going to certify my belonging somewhere? Do I think it's going to award me with the ability to say, well, now I can call myself pretty. Now I can call myself smart. Now I can call myself accomplished. Now I can call myself successful because I earned it. Or am I striving in a way that helps me again, feel alive, feel like more of myself, feel increasingly curious about the things that I love or want to solve Mm. or the relationships I want to build. And so how you're striving and why you're striving are the central guiding questions in understanding your relationship with perfectionism and whether it's leaning towards healthy tendencies or unhealthy tendencies. Mm. Those are two great questions and I just wrote them down. And for example, in the holiday birthday perfectionism. So when I'm striving for the birthday party perfectionism, if it's energizing because it's going to be pretty and I'm getting joy out of that, that's adaptive. But if I'm beating myself up, maybe snapping at my husband who didn't pick up the right, <laughs> this isn't the right blue. <laughs> it's the wrong shade of blue, because I'm trying to please people who are coming in from out of town or yeah. something, yeah. that's the maladaptive piece. Is that right? Yeah, because that would be like, how are you striving? You're striving in a way that isn't reflective of what I assume is your sense of values, right? Of mm-hmm. appreciating people and relationships mm-hmm. or the way something looks, and then asking yourself, why am I doing this? Mm. Why am I trying to make this party so beautiful? Mm. What would make a successful party? Mm. And you might consider metrics that are intentional, like, oh, if I hear kids giggling a couple Mm. of times, that's a successful party. Mm -hmm. If my kid is able to say thank you without a prompt from me, depending on what age they are, right? That's something I can note as like, wow, I'm proud of that. That's successful. Mm -hmm. If people are eating the cake and you can tell they love the cake and they're enjoying the cake or they're listening to the music and they're dancing and they're in the moment and I see my guests being in the moment, oh, that's a good metric. Mm -hmm. And those are things to kind of attach yourself to, to take yourself away from the Oh my God, if the balloons <laughs> continue to be stuck together, this is a disaster. It's hard to create your own metrics of success for a party, for yourself, for your relationship, for your friendships, for the ways your body looks, for the way your work output happens. But you have to. And that's what the book is about. It's about learning how to lead a self defined life, which is always the harder hmm. work because we already know what the culturally defined at least in America, life is. It's bigger, better, faster, more. There's nothing wrong with those metrics if they are aligned with who you are. They're not aligned with who I am. Mm. And when you lead a self-defined life, you don't get a lot of clapping other people and it can feel confusing because you're like, well, I'm the happiest person I know. (laughs) (laughs) So I'll never forget when I was in social work in my 20s. And I really was like, okay, I'm ready to go to graduate school and Mm -hmm. get my degree, move to New York City. I was living in LA at the time and start my practice. I'm going to do it. But I wanted to go to Columbia. It's a lot of money. I didn't want to graduate with debt. And so I decided to be a nanny for Hollywood family, two families actually. And I just gave a year and a half of my life away and worked constantly so that I could have this nest egg. And I was really proud of doing that. And I remember a lot of my friends who weren't really like my close friends, but a lot of people that I hung out with, as you do in your 20s, it's like less of a barrier (laughs) to entry (laughs) of friendship. The person that I was dating at the time in particular felt so bad for me, Mm. right? They were like, listen, it's going to get better. Like things like that, where it's like, (laughs) you can tell people feel bad for you. And I think a lot of us experience this in different ways, right? Like single women tell me this all the time, Mm. where it's like people will kind of be like, you know, you never know who you're going to meet, hang in there. And it's like, 
little do you know that single person is looking at your partnership and like, <laughs> thank God I'm not in that. <laughs> and so it's like when you encounter someone who doesn't have your same metric of success, which in that moment in my 20s, just autonomy and mm. not feeling obligated or burdened by finances was so important to me. And it felt so empowering mm. to be able to make decisions that freed up my choices of where yeah. to live, what to do, where to go to school, all that stuff. I was never happier, you know, than in that <laughs> moment. And yet people looked at that as like me taking many steps backwards mm. and mm. as me floundering or failing. And I don't put my energy towards trying to convince people, no, but I'm happy. Let me explain <laughs> why. Because it's like some people are just not going to get it. And you can explain stuff until you're blue in the face. You are the person who has mm. to justify your own sense of wellness. Mm. Happiness to me is a little bit overrated. I like peace better. Your own mm. sense of peace, meaning like when you lay your head down on the pillow, mm. do you feel okay and good mm. about who you are, what you're doing, the choices you're making, how you're spending your time? Mm. And if you can say like, yeah, I do, that is a wonderful feeling. Mm. And it's not always a visible accomplishment. Mm. So you have to be the one to congratulate and celebrate yourself for that stuff. I talk about the importance of celebrating invisible achievements so much in the book because mm. they'll pass you by if mm. you don't acknowledge them. Mm. Yeah, I talked with my clients a lot about celebrating. I think too, that also requires courage, like a lot of yeah. courage. And it can be triggering. I think some people might say in that situation when they, someone's saying, oh, I feel like you could see kind of the pity in their comment pity, or in the, yeah. <laughs> and that could be probably like if you don't have the awareness or the support or that feeling of confidence, it can be triggering in the, oh, wow, am I doing something wrong? Or maybe even cause some defensiveness. What would you say to someone who experiences that, who's trying to be on the path of self-decidedness? Is that how you worded it? Yeah, I would say it's natural when people around you, especially if they're close to you, whenever we are met with pity, that's never a good feeling. Pity is the polite version of judgment. And whenever we feel judged, we feel a separation mm -hmm. between us and the other person suddenly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, way to say that is it's a break in connection. Mm -hmm. And connection is whether we realize it or not, nothing impacts your mental health more than your relational wealth, meaning mm -hmm. more than the connections that you make. So when we feel a threat to that connection, it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And that's natural. And so really meeting yourself with some degree of understanding and like, oh, I wish they could understand what I'm trying to do or how much better this feels when I was like, quote unquote, crushing it at work or doing this or that. I wish they could. That would be nice. And just allowing yourself to sit with that mm. and not trying to, again, magically churn it into some positive, perfect, this is emotional perfectionism of like, mm -hmm. well, if I were healthy, I would be able to hear that and it would bounce off of mm. me. Mm. And I would just know that I am who I am and, <laughs> and who I am is someone who's amazing. Like nobody lives that way. We're mm. human beings. We mm. are so sensitive. <laughs> We're so sensitive and it's okay. Feeling's just a feeling. I always say to myself and the people that I work with, like thoughts and feelings are really different than actions. And as long as you can catch your thoughts and feelings before you allow them to dictate what you actually do with this one life that you have, mm -hmm. you're fine. Let yourself have a shitty moment over it. Everybody <laughs> does. It's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catherine, thank you so much for being here today. Where can people find your book? Where can people follow along? So the book is The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. It's available on Audible. I read the Audible myself. It was Ooh. so much fun. <laughs> on ebooks, in hardcover, wherever you get your books. And I'm on Instagram at Catherine Morgan Schaffler. And that's also the name of my website. So you can find more of my work there. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I enjoyed this conversation this so, so much. so much fun. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'll talk of to course. you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.